Yeah, I will talk a little bit about uh, a project which I recently did with Olga Neuwirth and Tal Rosner, which is called Disenchanted Island. Um, I've been working with Olga now about 20 years on many, many different aspects on spatial audio. And she came to me, uh, we've been sitting for coffee in Vienna a couple of years ago, and she was saying, um, you know, I've been living in Venice for a long time, and I, she got the chance to see Prometeo of Luigi Nono, which was performed in the Chiesa San Lorenzo, live uh, back then. Um, and this was a huge influence for her to work on spatial audio. So this church, which you can see here, is the Chiesa San Lorenzo. So originally, Prometeo was meant to, to be played in uh, the San Marco church, but then they changed plans and they moved into the Chiesa San Lorenzo which is in a little hidden part of, of Venice. So the church inside is, is somehow broken down and it is closed so you cannot access it. She, when she was living in, uh, in Venice, she was very sad that we lose these acoustics because for her, uh, these acoustics was very special. Especially in a piece of, of uh, Renzo Piano, uh, of, uh, of Luigi Nono, where Renzo Piano made this boat light structure. So uh, the case of San Lorenzo, it's two uh, coupled acoustic spaces, as you can see. Here, so here uh, you have two half domes um, in the church, which are coupled. So this makes very, very strange acoustics. And they build in this boat-like structure with a reference to the Venetian school, to Villard, to the Gabrielis, to have musicians surrounding the audience a little bit higher on the balcony. So you can see it here on the picture. So they've been using uh, balcony structure for uh, having musicians surrounding the audience with a lot of electroacoustics going on. And so we've been sitting in the coffee and she was saying, um, so I would like to use the acoustics of the church knowing that it's not accessible anymore. Um, I would love if you could capture it, if you could preserve these acoustics. So um, by the time we had a current research project on 3D room impulse responses, or let's say the acoustical fingerprints of, of spaces, which goes into room acoustic measurements, but adding space as a dimension in room acoustics measurements. Um, so we've been trying for three years or four years to, to get access to the church, which was a little bit tricky with all the Italian administration. And then um, the Mexicans have rented the space. So we had a layer of administration to run through. But finally, we could made it. Um, to get into the church and to measure 3D room acoustic room impulse responses and we'll let you know why this is important and, and what's the approach behind this. Um, so Olsen in, 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 in his book from 1972 um, described four necessary conditions for the perceptual illusion of realism. I like the term perceptual illusion of realism. Um, of course, we have to provide full spectral content. If you do a recording and you cut off some frequencies, it doesn't sound natural. We have no noiseless uh, reproduction, whatever, that's all clear. But we also have to, if you capture music in space, uh, preserve the spatial sound distribution. Um, when you now listen to 3D recordings of a, an orchestra playing in Musikverein Saal, and you have a proper playback system, you feel immersed because you hear not only the orchestra and the timber, which is also nice in the stereo recording, um, and the depth, but you also hear the surrounding uh, environment, which is the acoustics of the room itself. And we need the continuity of reverberation. And an important aspect is not only to capture, um, if you capture room acoustic room impulse responses, I will come to this uh, in, in a few seconds, you should also be able to render the directivity of a sound source because there's a strong influence. If I go away from the microphones, if I talk to you, you hear me clearly. If I turn around, you hear indirect sound and only the radiation characteristics of my voice. And so this forms the timber. This is orchestration. That's what composers do with classical orchestras on stage to put the trumpet players to the back because they are more directive, so they project sound better and violins to the left. That also comes from a, to get a nice mixture in the room and coloration. So that's one of the parts. And she wanted to play around with transforming the acoustics of a space, so to modify. Um, so one way to modify the acoustics of a space, it's to modify the space. So that's uh, a thing we can do uh, in our concert hall at Aircam, which is called the Espace de Projection. 
So here you can bring ceiling panels down, you can turn uh, acoustic absorption panels, um, so you can modify the acoustics from 0 0.4 seconds to up to nearby 4 seconds of reverberation time. Um, but that's not very practical and you cannot bring this into a concert hall. Um, there's another nice approach, for example, Beat Fuhrer was writing this beautiful piece, Pharma, where they build a box uh, inside the concert hall, so musicians outside of the box, and they open and close doors while musicians are playing, and the opening and closing doors is part of the, of the, of the score. So this is really beautiful. We wanted to go to another approach, which is, um, I'm, I'm working a lot of, of, of multi-channel or high-density loudspeaker arrays, or whatever you, you want to call them. So to, to use an active approach, um, to use loudspeakers to play back the acoustics of the church of the Kiesel San Lorenzo, for example. So to do so, we have to first catch, capture the fingerprint. So normally when you do a room acoustic room impulse response with an omnidirectional microphone array, you get the temporal distribution of sound energy. So you know direct sound comes first, some early reflections, some late early reflections, and then late reverberation. Um, but you will not be immersed. It's a mono-channel room impulse response. If you filter a sound with this room impulse response, you get an impression of the room, but not an immersion. So what to do? You add, you've seen this picture of the Eigen mic, for example, you add a spherical or a 3D microphone array. A 3D microphone array gives you the possibility, so you capture the sound pressure on the surface, in this case of a sphere, you can do some mathematics and sound transformations, and you can identify clearly, that's called plane wave decomposition. For example, here, this would be the sound pressure distribution. It's not very, very telling a lot of things. But if you do what we call plane wave decomposition, then you see, oh, there is a sound coming from this direction, there is a sound coming from that direction. So we have three sound sources which, where the traveling waves come uh, to the microphone array. So if you do this over time, you get a very nice space time frequency analysis of your uh, environment, which you can use um, then as soon as you're in this space-time frequency signal processing, um, you can modify, you can modify the spaces, you can try to cut out this part of the direct sound and move it to another place and whatever. So as we can see here, in a kind of, of simplified space-time representation, you get the direct sound of a certain direction, you get some early reflections which are very important for localization, you get the late early reflections which get more and more dense, which we normally refer to as cluster, and then you get the late reverberation which should be diffuse. So that's what we call the late reverberation diffuse sound field. And if you take the room impulse response uh, in 3D and you convolve it, um, which is just a filtering process, which is unfortunately a little bit expensive. <clears throat> then you um, can filter a signal and you hear, for example, the instrument playing virtually in the position um, where you have measured the room impulse response. If you do this in 3D, for example, with a spherical microphone array, you can first encode the room impulse response into, let's say, ambisonics. Um, and then you have to convolve with all the ambisonic channels. Just to give you some numbers, the Kisses and Renzo has about seven seconds of room impulse response time, uh, so reverberation time. Um, we use fourth order ambisonic, so 25 channels. We know that convolution is rather expensive of, or CPU demanding, to say it that way. Um, so you have to convolve 25 channels with seven seconds room impulse responses. And of course, you want to do this in real time because real time is fun. Um, and so, yeah, it's a little mess. So this eats up one CPU, for one instrument, it eats up one CPU of a Mac Pro, but you have some in there. So you can do some convolutions. Um, and you can try to bring it a little bit down, knowing that the very important part, if you take out the diffuse sound field, uh, which is coming from all directions, so there's not a lot of information uh, on, on directivity, if you take this first part, which is mostly often less than 100 milliseconds in convolution, so the direct expensive filtering, and you model this late part, you do some signal processing, denoising, modeling, and then you take an artificial reverberation, which is less expensive, and you extract the control parameters, um, then you can replace this by a less demanding filtering process, uh, which also gives you better control over this tail. Um, that's easy saying, uh, at least three years of research, um, implementing and whatever, but anyway, um, so to 
you get this energy decay relief, you go to time frequency plane, you extract your parameters, you shake it, you put it into your algorithms, and then you do some perceptual tests to see, oh yes, um, people cannot sense any difference when they listen to them properly. So then you have done it right. But then you go to the cases on Lorenzo and you measure your room impulse responses and through to the coupled acoustics, so two rooms coupled, which is very difficult. We have, first of all, no numerical simulation, which really works on this case of acoustics. And secondly, you have in the room impulse response a movement in the late reverberation, which means the late reverberation is not omni, also not completely diffuse. So the energy moves up to the ceiling. So this model, which we created here, doesn't work. So we had to convolve, we had to use some CPUs, um, but it's fine. And the second thing is you want, she didn't want only to you know, capture, take a picture and um, just project the, the acoustic picture of the church. That's a little bit annoying. So you want to tweak a little bit, you want to modify a little bit, you want to change a room from being big to small. Uh, you want to move sources around. If you want to move a source around, you have to measure for each position of the source. So then there's the question how to move, how to blend from one position to another. So there's a lot of signal processing going on. Um, that's just an example who shows you, like you may know um, um, the software we create, which is called Audio Sculpt, so sculpturing audio in time frequency plane, where you have a partial which you don't want to hear in your sound, so you wipe it out. You go to the frequency plane, you delete it, go back to time domain and everything is fine. And so we try to do the same, but we add one dimension. You say one dimension is not a lot, you add space. But if you go from time frequency to space time frequency uh, processing, then the pain really begins. Um, that's where mathematics comes in, but um, finally we can do so. So here you see an original 3D room impulse response for one frequency over time and just in a horizontal plane. Um, you see one annoying reflection here, where you say, okay, I want to wipe this out. Um, so that's the resynthesized one um, going in the mathematical model and back, just to see, does it work if I do not modify anything? And then you can clearly show that you can, by doing some signal processing, windowing in all these domains, you can wipe it out. Okay, so we know this works now. Um, the next thing is you want to, as I said, for this illusion of realism, you want to add sound source directivity. Um, if you want to add sound source directivity, you do not only have to capture with a spherical microphone array, but you also have somehow to model the radiation characteristics of a source. So what we are using here, that's measurements we did in the, in the Opera Hall at the Salzburg Festival. Uh, that's a project we did together with Ben Gurion University um, and the uh, RBTH Aachen University. Um, and you see here this nice, um, like the Ecusader loudspeaker, which you have seen uh, this time many, many uh, nice presentations about this technology. It's the same technology, putting some speakers on, on, on the surroundings uh, on a sphere. So that's just a big picture of the 64 channel microphone array. We do the same with loudspeakers. Since loudspeakers need more space, we cannot do so many points as we would need. So you put it on a turntable and you rotate it and you do recursive measurements just tracking the temperature to know that the speed of sound doesn't change too much and you get a very nice image. The problem is um, for one point receiver and, and uh, source, um, we do about 600 positions of uh, loudspeakers, we do 64 positions of microphones, so one room impulse response becomes now 20 gigabytes, um, which will not be able, so I've done a lot of convolutions using a huge cluster, so a computer cluster, but we are far from doing this on a real time. So for this approach, we have to fake a little bit what we've done with Alger. Um, as soon as we can extract the early reflections and the direct sound, we can use psychoacoustic findings, which we know how your brain will react on some modifications. That's the original SPOT model developed in, 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 in the 90s by Jean-Marc Schott and Olivier Wausfeld. So we extract this information and we modify the information, we put it back and we give you the, another illusion of moving sound sources. Okay, so we captured everything, now we want to play everything back. Um, we have very many different technologies, you've seen already one of these pictures. That's a typical WFS array, so wave feed synthesis, many, many small speakers, uh, a very dense array of speakers. 
Um, here uh, we have five centimeter speakers. We have a new one with 2.5 so that we can control the sound field up to seven kilohertz. Um, you put some arrays around you and you get at least in the horizontal plane a very nice picture. I will skip maybe the slides on the wave feed synthesis because this doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, just maybe to show you, yeah, here that it works. Um, that's just a simulation. You want to recreate the sound field for a certain frequency. You use all the speakers here. If you play them correctly, you can recreate the traveling wave in space. You can play around with some. You can play around with the shape of the wave. You can make a plane wave. You can let it travel in space and whatever. And the real fun part um, is when you do something which you call time reversal mirroring. Um, there's a mathematical solution it doesn't exist here, or it's tricky. It exists, but it's tricky. So you play before the wave was traveling on the array on this direction, you inverse time, the wave gets superimposed in this position, and you get a nice sound source. Just imagine you have the array here, and you create a virtual sound source in front of the array, which is beautiful when you have singing voice and whatever. And for the surrounding part, we've been using ambisonics, so if the order is high enough, you can also create the sound field very nicely or do some very useful panning. So the holophonic approach, in reality, in the concert hall is a lie, um, because we never have, never ever have enough speakers to do so. So to give you some pictures, this was from um, the concert, which we did with Ensemble de Contemporain. Um, so it's called Les Encandadas, it's the concert piece, it's a 70 minutes piece, six ensemble groups surrounding the audience, um, a 50, up to 50 channel ambisonic sphere. Um, Matthias Pincher was uh, conducting. Here you see, you also need some, some computers to do this in real time. Um, all musicians are closely microphoned, so everybody can be in his own virtual space. Um, we do everything in real time, so you can decide even during the concert if somebody changes spaces, which is fun, at least uh, during the rehearsals. The rest is written in the score, so it's a, a classical concert piece. And then we came to this idea, uh, we have a lot of material, we want to do a sound installation in, in Centre Pompidou, so we, or audio video installation, I would call it. Um, so they invited us over. Uh, here one picture. Um, here we did for the interactive part, which we, you will not be able to see in the concert. So you had two microphones. There was a part in the video where the video invites you to talk into the microphone. So you could go there, the totem gets some lights and you can talk into it and you feel immersed in the, in the church. Um, especially when children are in the room, it's really fun. And just to give you an idea for the playback, we've been using 50 channels of ambisonics. That's the little black dots here. Um, what was nice here, we could create the room by ourselves. So I could put damping material everywhere. Um, so I could wipe out the room because what happens normally, we create the room in the room. This works when I have a long reverberation time of seven seconds, then even it works in a two second reverberation time concert hall. If I would re want to recreate this room here into a concert hall, it just doesn't work because uh, it's masked by the acoustics of the concert hall. So that's a huge problem by this ro virtual room in the room concept. And we had for some voice effects behind the screen, uh, I can't remember, I think 64 channel wave feed synthesis array. So we made an adaptation for the Kubus. Um, my colleague Clément Cornot, Clément, Clément Cornot is he's sitting here, but also now in the Kubus because he's adapting a piece for the Kubus, which will be played this evening. Um, so when you listen to the piece, there is a part in the middle where we just recorded silence in the church. Um, it's a very, very different question how you can transport the feeling of being in a room without being interactive, without interacting with the room, without making noises yourself. Um, and you may hear the different layers of, of, of immersion. There are some piano parts at the end. Uh, she refers to Sahadid, where always you have the perturbation in her acoustics, something, an object going through the building, and she's using the tuned pianos. Um, which are in a different, very direct room. They are not highly reverberated to perturbate, to destroy the, the, the beautiful um, um, church room. And yeah, so you get a representation this evening. Um, I cannot join it because I have to catch my train in half an hour. Um, but have fun listening to it. And I very quickly also want to like to thank uh, Lutzka, Yannick for organizing this 
very beautiful uh, festival. I wouldn't call it co conference. It's a lot of work, but uh, I think it works perfectly fine out. And I'm very sorry that I have to leave to change my plans and leave today. So I would first of all like to thank you with a big applause for Yannick and Lutke.